morning. It's a pleasure to be here today. And thank you all for joining me for the session. As I was traveling from India for this event, transiting through four different airports, I was just wondering how technology and disruptions has changed our experiences of travel. Right from booking your airline tickets to your airport experience, to food on the go in airports, to the surround ecosystems, which is your lounges, which is about your cab booking or airport or taxi booking or your hotel bookings. You are actually interconnected and everything is in your hand, in your, in your tip of your hands. But one thing which so fascinated me when I entered this time in the immigration is uh, I didn't have to give my fingerprints. They took a photograph of mine and said you're good to go. And uh, I believe facial recognition is going to change the agility in which we traverse through airports. This reminded me of a TED talk I attended about a few months back, and uh, there were speakers from many walks of life. I had the opportunity to interact with the CEO of Bangalore International Airport, and for those of you who are not aware of Bangalore International Airport, it's the third largest airport in India, and it has a capacity of approximately 25 million plus passengers. Now, his talk for that day was innovations in airports. And the concept he was launching on the day was your face is your boarding pass. Essentially, the concept blends convenience, comfort, and safety of passengers and aims to make your face the single source of truth for air travel. And uh, he said that this is going to be a reality in the airport in the first quarter of 2019. He also said they are actually designing a new terminal and which will have experiences which is very persona based and they're taking inputs from passengers, from agencies, and they're also doing hackathons with the leading design schools in the world. Now, if I look at this concept, it connects very closely to the principles of design thinking, desirability, feasibility, and viability and how emotions and technology can blend together to amplify and create experiences for individuals, for consumers, and for businesses at large. While this is an experience that all of us would, would actually experience in the next few months, I found something fascinating, a video from Dolce Gabbana, which makes me believe that the relevance of technology would continue to amplify in the days to come. Video, please. So why should, uh, why should organizations adapt? If you look at it, a small percentage of technology organization is going to drive the futuristic business models for the large number of corporations to adapt, and that is a reality. Now with Infosys, Oracle, and our idea and understanding of the technology landscape, the business disruptions that is happening, the ecosystem with which our client operates, and the understanding of the consumer requirements, we believe that we are in a sweet spot to go along with our clients in navigating to the digital journey. So how do we go about navigation into the digital journey? Essentially, there are two core principles. One is a large amount of organizations actually need to understand and energize and modernize their core systems, which essentially means that you need to bring in significant amount of automation, not just technology automation, but also process automation. Remove the redundancies in the processes that is existing, delay your ecosystem, bring in insights and analytics, 
and make sure your systems and applications, the backend are very closely integrated. Your handshakes becomes very strong. And the second element of this is about amplifying the, amplifying the experience. Now, if you try to amplify the experience without modernizing your core, your experience will become just a technology user interface layer. I think the power of your modernized core with the data, the insights, the experiences that you have, if you put it across and try to see how you can reach your consumer base or you can attract the people beyond your consumer ecosystem better into, into sharing that experiences, that is when you really would be amplifying the experience of, of your customers. Now, this is very much possible in the existing Oracle technology landscape. If you look at the existing technology landscape of Oracle, you have applications and systems and technologies that assist you in modernizing the core as well as in amplifying your experience. As an example, in the recent past, we were working with one of the large auto distributors, and which started off as a very small organization and leapfrogged into something much larger. And on their journey, they had multiple challenges. And the challenges are threefold, the larger challenges. One is about cost and margin pressures, which all of us are aware of. And that primarily arises from the competition as well as the extreme demands from the customers. The second aspect is the growth happened due to a lot of mergers and acquisitions. And they did not have an ecosystem to integrate and bring this into, uh, into the foray. So that was a challenge that they faced. And the last is obviously the changing business rules in the game because of the Uberization and the autonomous car and what is the relevance about that to the industry. Now, Infosys and Oracle together on Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, along with Infosys Automotive uh, Solution on PaaS, we actually are enabling the client in their digital journey to move and to become one of the leading mobile-enabled digital organizations. Now, what are the benefits? In a very short time after this is implemented, there are three key benefits that has happened. One is about experience, second is about efficiency, and third is about agility. So experience, because there is a digital thread that is created today, right from the manufacturer to receiving, to sales, after sales support, and in terms of resale. Uh, so which means that the experience of the end user gets amplified because there is a thread on any of the parts that is there. And the second, obviously, you could do after-sale personalizations much more effectively and efficiently today. In terms of the efficiency that we brought in, it is about the warehouse management. There's a paperless, paperless automated warehouse that we have created, the system, which makes the movement in the warehouse much more efficient. The storage space becomes much more better used, and it is all paperless. And in terms of agility, so that we have created a template for mergers and acquisitions, which makes any organization integrates much faster with a lot more of agility. And the last part is about the financial consolidation, which is internal focus, but it has improved in efficiency by approximately 60 to 70%. Now, rather than me speaking about this example, we have a client, Infosys and Oracle client, Acosta, and I would like to welcome Melissa, Vice President of Enterprise IT, to share her experiences in the digital journey. Wow, thank you so much, Gopi. Amazing crowd, wow, it's, it's a blessing for me that I can't really make out your faces because that wouldn't help with this nervous energy that's going on. So if you're smiling or frowning, doesn't even matter to me because I can't see your faces, that's a plus. Um, certainly excited to be here and excited about this great group. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, our journey at Acosta. And so um, as you guys know already, um, Emphasis and Oracle has been an amazing partner um, for us over the last two and a half years if, as we've embarked over, oh my God, one of the largest um, transformation technology exercises that we have ever had. Um, Acosta, it, we are in the CPG industry. Um, we have about 37,000 employees. We are based out of our corporate offices in Jacksonville, Florida, have a heavy footprint in Europe, in Canada, and so we're all over the place. Um, and my role in this, basically, when I came to the table, um, we were uh, deciding on what we wanted to do in, in, in terms of our back office systems, right? We have lots and lots of acquisitions. That's how we do a major part of our business. And so people come to the table, and we have all these lines of businesses, and everybody's kind of doing their own thing. And of course, their thing is the absolute best thing, right? 
And so Emphasis uh, partnered with us to help us determine what our end goal should be, what our solution should look like. We partnered with them as well as Oracle, and we started on this journey. And I'll tell you what a journey it has been. We have um, tremendously, when you talk about modernizing the core, we have brought our back office systems to a place that was unheard of when I walked in the door about uh, 24 months ago at Acosta. Um, I'm an Oracle girl. Uh, been doing this for about 25 years, and so certainly no stranger to the industry, but I was a stranger to the spaghetti platform that our infrastructure comprised of when I walked in the door. So I'm excited about where we've come from and excited certainly about where we're going. So why was this digital uh, transformation crucial for us at Acosta? Um, well, first of all, we needed to gain some customer insights, right? So we're in the marketplace, and we're trying to be a differential in the marketplace, and when it comes to metrics and to, to let our executives know exactly how we were doing, we were all over the place. I talked about our various lines of business, and so we'd have some reporting uh, coming from somewhere in an old antiquated system. Um, our other vendors would come to the table and ask, how are we doing? How do we know that you're really uh, working for us? And we really had no way uh, to talk about that. We're extremely project-centric, and so we needed to be on a platform that was common, right? So that we can actually deliver um, something good to our customers. And so um, Emphasis came in. Uh, it, was, it was certainly uh, a partnership that from the start, many weren't even believers that we could uh, make it through this journey. And so uh, we are well on our way. We um, are compliant in a lot of areas that before we hadn't even touched, right? When it comes to automation, we were uh, a large company, however, we started kind of mom and pop-ish uh, in Jacksonville. And so even some of the platforms that we're on right now when it comes to technology, um, it baffles those that actually started off with Acosta. And so uh, we, we, we are crossing over into something in our industry. Um, and I don't know how many of you are even familiar with the CPG industry. Anybody at all? Yeah? So if you would follow us, uh, you, you kind of would know our story from beginning to end. And again, we have totally transformed. Our IT shop used to be probably about, I don't know, 25 to 30 employees, and now we're looking at probably close to 300. So certainly, as we acquire all of these business, um, it's an opportunity for us to really modernize our core. And so that's what our journey has mainly been about. Um, we have acquisitions, like I said. We have a heavy footprint in Canada, which is our, our marketing in, and then we have our sales in that's based out of Jacksonville. So we have these field workers that are all over the place, and we're trying to move in this space, and we had no idea from a back office perspective what we were doing. And by the way, our employees are our largest commodity. So this HCM transformation that we just did has taken us leaps and bounds um, in this industry. So I'll talk a little bit about that. We totally shifted, if you will, um, uh, what we say swipe from left to right. So we have handhelds that are now in the fields. Before, if we would send somebody to a gig, let's just say an employee went out to a Sam's Club to do some business, he would log in on paper, they would fax this paper down to our corporate office. We had no idea how to pay these people, what they were actually getting paid. And so now, when we're on this common platform for HCM, we can actually track our employees. Totally reduced our onboarding process by in excess, actually, of 50%. And um, we've just, we, we, you can't even imagine if you looked at us on paper where we were two years ago and where we are today, right? So this cloud has totally, totally transformed um, where we are today. Um, optimize some of our process flows. Again, I talked about our acquisitions, right? So you have 20 different companies that are coming to the table and everybody does their processes perfect, okay? So how do you get these people to come to a common platform? And that was certainly a challenge for us. Our upper leadership uh, wanted to respect the leaders of these other organizations as we brought them in, but it came to a point in time where somebody had to say, listen, we are going to come to a common platform, we're gonna establish some common processes, and we're gonna bring this all into our back office systems. And emphasis was vital in helping us get to that point, actually. Um, we spent tons and tons of time doing JAD sessions, bringing everybody in, talking about what it is that we're doing, how do we take this process to the next level. And so certainly, when you talk about bringing those processes together and modernizing them, we're there. And um, if I had to give ourselves uh, a report card, I'd say we started off with a D minus, and now we're at probably an A minus. So we have, um, 12,000 of our 37,000 employees that are already live functioning in the cloud. Um, in December, we'll bring up others. And when I say in the cloud, guys, I mean the total suite of HCM 
as well as our total suite of ERP and finance. And we've locked in some Kronos and some ADP. So we are doing a huge transformation. And we have 37,000 employees. We're bringing on the other 20 some thousand employees uh, in March. We'll have the entire company live. And this is again with the blueprint um, that we worked through about 18 to 24 months ago with emphasis. It is a huge story uh, for us and I'm certainly excited to be a part of the journey. Um, we have some outcomes certainly that we, we've realized. Um, when it comes to revenue, most of you know that back office, we don't really generate any revenue. However, we have saved a ton of money as it relates to just streamlining our processes. And um, we were able to leverage some employees, not so much uh, get rid of them, but kind of transition them into some different departments because we just didn't need as many people to do the manual processes that they were doing um, before. And so as we think about the future and think about where we're going, it's gonna be a breeze to bring in our new lines of business. As our employees go out and they uh, generate new business, it won't be uh, a 12 month process in order to get these other companies uh, to come into our back office systems. And so we feel good about where we are. Um, a little bit about some of the business benefits that we've achieved at Acosta. Um, certainly, listen guys, I said I can't see your faces. Part of it is because there's a lot of you out there and there's lights, cameras. The other thing is because I wear glasses but I didn't think it would do good on camera. Um, so I didn't wear them. So, I'm gonna step a little bit closer to this screen to talk about our business benefits. Um, easy incorporation, uh, some of the new lines of business, I talked a little bit about that. Um, enhanced end user experiences, we're swiping now where before we would be uh, trying to run to a computer, they share desktops in the field. It was just um, totally outdated and wasn't answering the mail for what we were doing and so we were in a much better place for that. Um, improved decision-making for our executives. So when we give reports for our executive, I remember we had a new uh, chief of HR that came in and she was wanting to know how much time it took for us to get employees uh, in the door. Um, and it was an embarrassing conversation to have with her at the time because we weren't really live yet. And I'll tell you that I met with our executive team about two months ago uh, just to talk about where we were and we had made major strides and she's actually excited about partnering with us. So we're doing big things, we're moving forward. Um, it was a huge journey, I'm excited about the partnership. We've totally modernized our, our organization and now we can say that our back office is actually matching what we're trying to do in the workplace. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, that was a fascinating example. Um, how do we, you know, digital is a pretty all-encompassing word, and uh, to simplify it, we have actually tried to define um, the digital journey under the five axis of a pentagon. So if you look at it, we have the five axis defined, which is about accelerate, is about assure, experience, insight, and innovate. Accelerate is about your automation and AI and primarily drives the modernizing your core, and it is, it is, it is making sure that your core is energized. There's always a debate between privacy and convenience, and in the digital world, this is not two parallel tracks, they have to go together, which means there'll be a significant investment that is happening in terms of assurance of your security and safety, as well as in terms of data privacy. So the investments will happen, and that is about the Azure services. It's about insights, all of us are aware, it's about making meaning of the data, giving data insights and inferences which you could use in terms of attracting your consumers, and the experience is using that and reaching out to your consumer base. And finally, it is about innovate, which is the new business models and the services that is happening. If you look at it, most of the devices that is getting uh, created today are, uh, have the ability to talk to each other, which means that you need to have your IoT strategy in place, and then with the advent of blockchain and so on and so forth, there's a lot more of newer things that each of the organizations has to adapt. Now, how do we go take our clients through this journey? And uh, we have defined certain accelerators to take our clients through this journey. So for example, there could be clients who are in legacy who can move into the digital pentagon, and there could be clients which are pioneers in digital who will be within the digital pentagon, and uh, we, need, we can actually move them across in the Pentagon. As an example, one of the leading consumer manufacturers uh, who was a pioneer in digital when they had their foray into India, the business model was entirely different. They had more than 600 small stores. 
and uh, there was a concept of non-banking financial institutions giving retail loans to the consumers. So if I, as a consumer, walked in into that ecosystem, and if I want to have a loan to buy the product, I would not get that loan on that day because these, these organizations and systems are never integrated. We are building a platform, actually, for them, which means these, these ecosystems get integrated, and you are able to navigate them within the Pentagon into newer areas so that I, as a consumer, has a better experience, buy the product on the same day, and the company doesn't lose business. So there are five accelerators which we have defined to navigate in this journey. Uh, the first two is about execution accelerators, which is Agile Plus and Automation Plus. I spoke a lot about Automation Plus and the experiences that we have shared here. Agile Plus is the future business models and the future execution mechanisms would be very agile in nature. Uh, we'll have more show and tell models. We will have uh, fail fast, recover faster kind of models. And uh, people want to see efficiency uh, very quickly rather than waiting for a couple of years or more. So um, Agile Plus and Automation Plus together helps you in terms of modernizing your core ecosystem. The next two are the enablers for modernizing the core. And these two accelerators are Learning Plus and Proximity Plus. Uh, we have realized that digital is a confluence of your creative mind and your analytical brain and requires a lot of people to repurpose themselves, and that is very important. So we at Infosys have created a learning platform. We call it Wingspan, which enables us, uh, all the employees, and we are now launching it with our customer base, to repurpose themselves any place, anywhere, synchronous, asynchronous, and so on and so forth. A small demo of Wingspan. At a time when every industry is facing exponential technology change. What if your growth experience was given wings by the same technology that's disrupting the world? With Infosys Wingspan, you as a learner are enabled to learn on the go, seamlessly on any device, whether online or offline. Browse through the evolving best-in-class curated content from multiple sources and be engaged in micro-learning and macro-learning. Steer a path with Wingspan's Navigator to access dynamic learning paths created for roles, skills and interests. Get up close and personal with Wingspan Set goals to increase your and your team's learning fitness. Keep a track of progress through the learning history and create playlists and share with peers and teams. Make learning a social experience with Wingspan cohorts, engage with the experts and educators or co-learn with your own peers. Enhance competencies with the technology playground Practice on a wide range of technologies without any machines, software installations, only with a web browser. Interact with the AI-powered voice-enabled learning assistant to get guided learning on Wingspan. Gamify learning through cool badges and leaderboards and obtain learning insights through personalized dashboards and extensive activity tracking and reporting. Wingspan also lets you integrate the best-in-class content from external partners, MOOCs and universities. Revolutionize learning with Infosys to help you navigate your next. Wingspan uh, was launched about six months back in Infosys and we have got approximately 130,000 users and more than uh, 30,000 artifacts, which is created by emphasis our partner ecosystems and universities. It is there in our showcase zone, and if any, any, is, any one of you is interested, you can see that, and uh, it actually uh, is very much customizable to specific needs in terms of content. Um, the next accelerator which I want to speak about is Proximity Plus. A lot more of projects that we are doing today are agile in nature. The business is evolving to be more personal centric today. So which means that a lot of execution models need to be in the proximity of the customer as well as the end consumers. And with this in mind, Infosys has created around six innovation hubs in the United States, in, then in Australia, and we are launching innovation hubs in Europe, which means that a lot of new, net new talent need to be created in these, in these innovation hubs. We are doing that with partnerships with multiple universities, and one such unique 
partnership that we have is with the Trinity College. I do have uh, Sonia, Dean of Academic Affairs from Trinity College, giving a perspective on how they are working with Infosys to create net new talent. Sonia. Thank you, Gopi. Good morning. It's great to be here. And I have to say that we're going to switch gears a little bit because I have a very different background than the other speakers. I'm a political scientist, I'm a dean, and I do not speak at tech conferences. You know, they tell you that you need to know your audience. I don't know my audience this morning. But that is actually why I want to be here, because I believe deeply as an educator that we have to be willing to have conversations across industries, including with higher education, if we are really going to think in new ways. So our journey with Infosys started about seven months ago in Hartford, Connecticut, which is where Trinity is located. And I'm not sure if, if many of you know, but Hartford is actually has an emerging innovation ecosystem with a lot of very enthusiastic players. That includes healthcare and insurance and government and higher education. So this is why Infosys chose Hartford as one of its five technology innovation hubs. And our vision is to create a hybrid talent pool that bridges the liberal arts and digital technology. And some of you may be sitting there thinking, I, I think I've heard this before. And perhaps you have, just out of curiosity, how many people in the room have a liberal arts background? I can't see you very well, but are there any? Not very many, I think. That's very interesting. So Steve Jobs famously remarked on this intersection, and it's inspired us, and perhaps it's inspired some of you. Have a listen. Technology alone is not enough. That it's technology married with liberal arts, married with the humanities, that yields us the result that makes our hearts sing. I love that. Every time I hear that, I, I, I love it. Um, what we are trying to do in this partnership is, is bridge the liberal arts and digital technology, but in a very concrete way in living out this vision that, that Steve Jobs uh, referred to, what we want to do is we're going to train liberal arts graduates so that they are able to work and thrive in the technology consulting space. And it's interesting, uh, Burning Glass, I don't know if any of you have seen this report, but Burning Glass came out with a report that said that hybrid jobs, jobs that combine unusual skill sets, those are the ones that are, most, that are very often in very high demand but also fairly low supply, right? They're in high demand and low supply. And this is the skills gap that we are trying to address. What we want to do is we want to take a strong liberal arts graduate and add, give her additional skill sets, right? So that if we have somebody who has studied economics or history or philosophy or literature, that they are going to be able to leverage and apply those skills in new ways. And if you think about it, and there aren't too many of you with a liberal arts background, but if you think about it, one way we like to think in the liberal arts about the liberal arts, it's that it's really a human-centric education, right? It's a human-centric education. And we are convinced, absolutely convinced, that these human-centered skills are only going to rise in importance. They're going to become more significant, not less significant, with changes in technology and even rising automation. If you don't believe me, this is what the latest Future of Jobs report by the World Economic Forum also tells us. It's not that technology skills are not going to be of high priority is that they're only one part of the equation. What really is going to matter for the future of work is the combination, the combination of technology skills and soft skills. 
right? And this is sort of, this is similar to bridging the arts and the sciences, which is really at the heart of the liberal arts. And I think it's actually amazing and appropriate that we are talking about technology here in this performing arts space. These skills that I am referring to, the skills that are these soft skills, these are both cognitive skills and non-cognitive skills. And what's really fascinating, I think, is that employer report after employer report says, including the World Economic Forum, that these are going to be the most important skill sets for the future. But again, what's interesting is that these are precisely the skills that are most closely associated with the learning outcomes of a liberal arts education. Again, it's about bridging that creativity and critical analysis. One of the very first things that I learned about Infosys is that it is an organization that creates talent where talent didn't exist. It's truly a learning organization, which is why Trinity College felt it resonated with us as an institution. And when you think of the liberal arts, and again, not too many people here have a liberal arts background, you often think of a very traditional education. But what I want to emphasize and leave you with is that we are joining forces to create a new talent pool that leverages the liberal arts to have talent that creates human-centered experiences. That's really what it's about. And that's why I'm here. It's about creating and designing human-centered experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I just want to go into the, the final accelerator, which is about Design Plus. Now you have modernized your code, you have the enabling ecosystem, and what more do you need? You need to amplify your reach to your consumers. And in the recent past, Infosys has, uh, enab uh, has created a capability through two organizations, which is Brilliant Basics and uh, Wong Duty. I would request Ben, who is the CEO of Wong Duty, to share his perspective on Design Plus. Hi. Uh, feel free to giggle. Uh, I am Ben Wiener from Wong Duty. And I get to say that like five times a day, um, such is my curse. Uh, I imagine Wang Duty is not a household name for you guys, um, but we are one of the newest members of the Infosys family. Um, and we have been part of Infosys for about seven months, helping Infosys clients get closer to their customers and to navigate this convergence of experience and technology and commerce that is shaping consumer behavior. Uh, when we talk about digital, we think about how companies are forcing consumers to act and the gap between that and how customers really want to act. Because Infosys clients, all clients, have legacy business models, legacy structures, legacy infrastructure, legacy systems that are set up a certain way. And often those ways are completely disconnected from how customers today want to buy things, want to behave, and want to be treated. One customer that we share with Infosys is T-Mobile. And we have worked with T-Mobile for the last 15 years through some ups and some downs. Recently, there have been a lot of ups. But there was a very, very dark time at the end of the failed AT&T merger where T-Mobile had been left for dead. We were hemorrhaging customers like you wouldn't believe because believe it or not, nobody wants to sign up for a cell phone carrier that may not exist in a few months. That's a very, very difficult value proposition. Um, and the merger did not go through, and T-Mobile lived, and we had this brand, and we were wondering, what the hell are we going to do with it? And T-Mobile had brought in a maverick, visionary CEO by the name of John Ledger, who brought all of his agencies together and said, what are we going to do? Uh, status quo is not going to cut it. And I would argue that his vision was to make T-Mobile the first truly digital phone carrier. Digital in the sense that we looked at all of the points of friction 
in the cell phone industry and decided that we were going to find a way to overcome them. That two-year contract that you had to sign that somehow they got you to renew every time you picked up the phone, we got rid of that. Connecting the phone that you own with the plan that you're on so that you could only upgrade with a new two-year contract, we got rid of that and introduced a program called Jump that lets you, you decide um, how much you want to upgrade your phone or not. Um, People were really, really annoyed about the fact that they would sign up for a $39.95 a month plan, but by the time they got their federal talking tax and their state talking tax and their local recycling your plastic phone tax and the supplementary equipment override, it was $63 a month and it was messing with people's budgets. So we found a way to actually have transparent pricing. Like the price that we told you was the price that you actually paid on your bill every month. And for certain customers, they were really, really annoyed that we would gouge you 40 bucks for a text message just because you went to Tijuana for the weekend or went hiking in Vancouver. So we made roaming free you know, in Canada and in Mexico. These were all disruptions that changed the industry and were responsive to what consumers actually wanted. And part of our challenge was how to bring that to life in a way that didn't feel like every other carrier. Um, so we're gonna run a quick video of some of the branding that accompanied this disruptive maverick attitude. But. So I would argue that T-Mobile today is really the only brand in the carrier space. You know, everybody else is like, who's their spokesman today? What show were they on? What ad campaign did they used to be in? Um, at least when I see a lot of magenta, uh, I know it's T-Mobile and it's kind of funny. The, the printers at the office, we run out of magenta toner like nine times as much as absolutely everything else. Um, T-Mobile has a lot of retail locations and the primary function of those retail locations used to be a place where people came in to pay their bills. Really, like Friday, payday, once a month, people would go into the store, write a check. Well, you know, digitization is taking care of a lot of that. T-Mobile's successful migration of its customers to a self-service model has you know, taken that use case out of retail. So one of the questions we're always asking ourselves is what do we do with this physical footprint? We have brick and mortar stores, people are coming into them, what do we want them to do? And the retail stores are a really good vehicle, once again, for communicating the T-Mobile brand. We have certain stores that we call signature stores in high profile areas that we've designed, not just to sell you a cell plan, but to tell you what T-Mobile is all about. There's one in New York, and basically it's in Times Square, people just wanna take a selfie in that one. Uh, there's one in Vegas on the Strip, that one we've designed for drunk people. Uh, not really, but you know, seeing if you're awake. Uh, and there's one in Miami that is in an area that's full of nightclubs. It's open late, people are going out to dance, and we thought, how do we bring a dance experience into the store that can also be projected on the screens outside the stores and also shareable through people's social graph? And here's a demo of the experience in Miami. You can play that video. <laughs> That's 
So that's kind of cool. Um, and, and if you're outside the store, you can see that, what's going on. So last but not least, um, everybody, until T-Mobile, of course, uh, hates their phone carrier. No matter who you're with, Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, doesn't matter, uh, you generally feel ripped off. You generally feel that no matter how hard you shopped, uh, there was a better deal to be had. Like, you think you're all psyched with the, you know, I got the family plan for 99 bucks. And then you talk to somebody, they said, oh, there's an $89 plan with a different carrier that has more data. And you're like, oh, no matter what is a purchase that people, no matter how smart, feel shitty about. Um, and there's a lot of rage. And rage is a consumer marketing opportunity. So when we launched T-Mobile as the uncarrier uh, with the elimination of the two-year contract, um, we did a couple things. We decorated T-Mobile locations with shredded two-year contracts. We had shredders inside stores so that people could come in with their paperwork from AT&T and Sprint and shred those right there. And then we had something called the breakup letter, where you could write a letter to your old carrier. And this came out of an insight in a focus group where a woman said, getting out of AT&T was like breaking up with a bad boyfriend. Uh, and you could write a letter to your carrier and mail it to them or hold up a sign, as you can see, that says, bye bye Sprint, see you later AT&T, and share that with all of your friends uh, to let them know that you had dumped your carrier and had gone with T-Mobile. Tapping into that consumer rage <laughs> was incredibly successful. Uh, the gold standard, you know, as far as for metrics in the, in the wireless industry, net ads. We had a 2.75 million net ads in one month. That's what jump-started T-Mobile from number four to number three, overtaking Sprint. Uh, and hopefully the best is yet to come. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. I would like to summarize now. We touched upon the disruptions, the digital Pentagon and the services in the digital area, and the accelerators which will enable us in modernizing the core as well as amplifying the experience. But I want to leave you with three specific points and messages. One is um, digital disruptions and changes are here to, say, here to stay. Um, if you look at it, the pace of change that we are experiencing now is the fastest we have ever seen, but it will be the slowest we will ever see. Which means that if you are a skeptic as an organization in embracing disruptions, this is the place to leave the skepticism and embrace disruptions as fast as possible to stay relevant. The second point is about repurposing and refactoring. Someone once told me that a lot of people who come into the ecosystem today are already on a moving train and a lot of people who are within the ecosystem are on the platforms. You need to repurpose and refactor to catch up with them, which means it's not just about a technology refactoring. It is about repurposing ourselves as individuals in terms of creative confidence, in terms of understanding the emotion and pulse of the end consumers, and connecting all these two things together to create business value. And the third part is about organization structures, agile and nimble organization structures. I have a mentor who left his job as a creative director and pursued his passion in jazz music. And he's got his own jazz band now. And he is also got, create, founded a company called Brand Music, which is essentially branding through music. Now, when I converse with him about digital, he always tells me that digital is a confluence of the left brain and the right brain. He went, goes on to add saying that the Traditional organizations are like the Western orchestra. You have a music conductor who's like the CEO, who pretty much controls everything, and the people who play different pieces of music to a script, and they, don't, they do not change the script, they do not improvise, and in the end, they get a result. The modern and the new organizations, he says, should be like the jazz band. The structure should be like a jazz band. Jazz band, you have a leader, but the leader is for the purpose of giving a vision and a direction. Once it comes to execution, it is collaborative execution. It is about improvisation, it is about collaboration, it is about agility, and it is about adaptability. The newer organization structures that we have needs to move from the Western Orchestra to a jazz band. Thank you so much.